This is a preview of our video from our online Ortho Essentials 101 course. We hope that you like it. And if you do like it, click the link in our description to find out some more information. All right, everybody, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about some more basic science. And now we're kind of just going to go into uh, into place. So in this talk, we're going to go over the plate functions, and then we're going to go over some of the different plate types. So the plate acts how you want to how you want it to uh, function, right? So you can use a single plate, but you can have it function in many different ways and different uh, in different functions, right? So a plate can function in neutralization mode. It can function as a compression plate. It can be used to buttress a fracture, or as some people call it, an anti glide fashion. It can be used to bridge fractures, and it can also be used as a tension band technique. So we'll kind of go over some of these different fractures and different uses of plates. So let's say, for example, we have a fracture. So let's talk about place used in neutralization mode. So we have a fracture here and we have an oblique line here and say that we fix this fracture. We, we fix this kind of primary fracture line with a screw that's going perpendicular to the fracture. We're getting nice compression across this line. So say you have a screw that's fixing this fracture. And if you do just this, this plate is stable in, in an axial plane. So if you compress it, but if you imagine it, if you try to twist both ends of the bone, this is not going to be that stable in uh, if you if to torsional forces, right? So one way that a plate can be used, it could be used to neutralize those those rotational forces, right? So you'll you'll, for example, you may fix the primary fracture with some interfragmentary screws, and then you'll use a plate to neutralize the uh, rotational forces. So that's one way to be uh, for a plate to be used is to be used in neutralization mode again. All right. So that's again, that's one way that a plate is being used to neutralize a fracture. Another way that you can use a plate is you can use a plate to compress a fracture. So say, for example, we have our fractured ends here and we have a transverse fracture of the bone here. There are different kinds of plates that have different designs where you can actually compress through the plate itself. Because to think about it, if you were trying to get a screw to compress across the transverse fracture, ideally you want the screw to be perpendicular to the fracture plane in order to be able to get compression along that line. So when we had an oblique fracture, like in this previous slide, you could put a screw that again was uh, perpendicular to get compression across there. Now, if you had to think about it, if you have a transverse fracture, where would the screw need to be? It would need to be in the shaft <laughs> to be completely perpendicular to it. So now there are some plates that have these, these different designs where you can actually compress through the plate. So you'll put some screws in on, on either sides of the bone and the plate has these on the holes, instead of the holes being square and rigid, they'll have more of a kind of a slope to it so it's more eccentric right so you think about it if you have a screw and you put it in the eccentric part of the plate right so you put it in on this side as the screw head goes down and engages with the plate it'll move the plate and compress the bone so if you're putting a screw eccentrically on this side right as the screw goes down in order for it to be flush with the bone and excuse my my bad drawing here the plate will uh the, the the fracture will get compressed because the plate will kind of move this way right so you have the plate rigidly fixed on one side of the bone and you eccentrically place screws on the other side of where the fracture is and you get actually compression through the plate that's going to be compressing this fracture right here so that is a plate that's being used in compression mode now, say, for example, uh, we have a patient that has a tibia plateau fracture. So let's just say this is, a, this is the top of the plateau. This is a plateau here. And another uh, way to use a plate is going to be in what's, what we call buttress mode. So classic example is when you have a, a fracture that wants to slide down, right? This is like a vertical fracture. So if you imagine... The, the forces of the fracture, the fracture wants to go and, uh, and and go down, right? So it wants to slide down. And the way that I thought about this, or the way that it was described to me is if you wanted to put your thumb somewhere to hold this fracture up, where would you put your thumb? Would you put it down here? No. Would you put it right here? No. You put the plate, you put your thumb right here. And so that's how these plates function. So you can use a plate to buttress 
um, to buttress a fracture. So you put it right at the crux of where this 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 axilla is, and you put some screws. You know, you put some screws across the plate to hold everything in place. And basically, what this plate is serving as is a buttress to these shear forces on the tibia. So this is going to be a plate that's being used in a buttress fashion because it's buttressing the fracture fragment. All right. So again, these these forces, these shear forces that are that are uh, wanting to go down, you're making this axilla for all the forces to uh, go right into. Right. And that's how you uh, that's how you would use a plate in buttress mode. An anti glide. This is almost similar to to kind of a buttress, but let's say we have a fibula here, and then we have a uh, a, a tibia fracture over here. And let's say we have the opposite, right? So this is a medial mal. This is the lateral mal, and we have a fracture line coming up here. You'd imagine this fracture fragment is going to shear, right? So if this is going to displace, it's going to kind of displace, you know, upwardly because this is this is a vertical line. So similarly to buttress, if you think, where would you put your thumb in order for uh, you to hold this fracture in place? You put it right here at the apex. So you do the same thing with the plate. So you put a plate on the bone and you put a screw right across, uh, right across the fracture sign right there to again create an axilla for those forces to come right up into so it's the same almost similar concept for a buttressing when we were buttressing a fragment here when we we're buttressing this uh this plateau fragment here now we're using the plate kind of as an anti-glide so these fractures don't glide upwards another way that you could use a plate you could use it in bridging mode to so say we have a fracture that is highly commuted right and so we have a, a lot of different pieces of the fracture and that we're not going to be able to get primary bone healing because we're not going to be able to get the screws or anything across all these different fragments. And we want it to heal with secondary bone healing. We can use a plate to bridge this fracture and give it some type of stability. Um, that way the fracture can heal via secondary bone healing, right? So you have a plate that bridges, bridges the fracture again. That's why it's called a bridging plate. And you have screws, you know, that going on each side of the uh, each side of the plate, say about three on each side, give or take one, two, three. And this is a plate that's being used to bridge this commuted fracture. So that's going to be a plate used to bridge a fracture. And the last one we could say kind of this this tension band um, uh, technique it being used to for uh, for fixation. So a classic example of this is going to be an, an olecranon fracture. And say we have a fracture that's going along right here. So as you can imagine here, we have the triceps that comes and inserts on the olecranon, right? So say this is our, our tricep tending pulling in here. And so you have tensile forces that are going in, in this direction right? So we have tensile forces on, on each side of this fracture that's pulling this fracture fragment and gapping it. And so a plate uh, can be used as a tension band construct is when you, let's say we apply this plate to this, this side of the bone here. And we use this plate and we have screws that are going into the bone uh, and screws that are going in here. And so what this plate is basically doing is it's converting these compressive forces on one side into, I'm sorry, it's converting these tensile forces on one side into compressive forces on the other side, All right? So that's basically the idea behind this tension band um, technique of where you're using the plate to help convert the tensile forces into compressile forces. And another time you'll see this is when you talk about like patella fractures, for example, there's a tension band technique for that. And there are are also a lot of different plate types. So those are just the functions. Again, neutralize, you can use it to neutralize a fracture, compress a fracture, use it in a buttress mode, anti-glide, bridging, and, and as well as a tension band. And there are different types of plates. And we can quickly kind of go over some of these other types of plates that are commonly used in orthopedics that are just to get used to. So when you have a semi-tubular plate, uh, one third semi-tubular, all that means is if you think of a tube, the plate is just like a third of a tube. So the plate is like that. And the plate, these types of plates are a little bit more malleable. I mean, you can kind of bend them with your hand and your fingers and they're a little bit 
smaller than some of the other plates. And they're commonly used to treat, like, for example, ankle fractures or lateral malleolus fractures. You may use a one-third semitubular plate to uh, fix these fractures. Again, it's a little bit more malleable, and again, it's one-third of a tube. You also have dynamic compression plates. So when you have plates, let's see here, where we were talking about earlier, let's so say this is, this is looking from the side, and the actual holes in the plates are something like, like this, right? So if you, let me do another one here. So you have an area where you can just kind of put a screw in and the screw head will fit great onto the bone. It'll go right through the plate and it'll provide friction against the bone and this will go all the way down and this will keep the plate in the same position where it is. But that dynamic compression is that you have areas where the plate where the holes are actually angled or e eccentric. So when you put your screw on this side of the plate, as you tighten the screw down, you'll imagine that the screw will engage with this part of the plate. And as it goes down, it'll shift the plate and, and allow for some, some compression to be made through the plate, right? So if you have this and you start to screw this down, as the screw starts to engage with the plate and in the bone, in order for this to be all the way flush, the plate will move and you, you'll get some compression through the plate. And then you also have limited contact dynamic compression plates, which basically all that means is on the bottom of these plates, there are just some areas that are cut out. So the entire plate isn't pushing against the bone. So like, for example, instead of the bottom of the plate being just straight solid and you're compressing the bone with the plate, right? Because because there's blood vessels uh, on the actual bone, on the periosteum. And the thought is that if you use a solid metal plate on the bottom and you're compressing everything, um, everything down when you have a fracture, you know, with your plates and screws, that you could actually be cutting off some of the blood supply to the to the bone itself. And so they have these plates that have these designs where parts of the bottom of the plate is just actually cut out. So there's this limited contact, right? So just there's some of the areas of the bottom of the plate is cut out. So you just get limited contact with the plate in the bone. And you have these areas where the plate's not, uh, the plate isn't pressing up against the bone. So theoretically you're not cutting off a lot of the periosteal blood supply to the fracture because fractures need blood in order to heal. Another type of plate are these reconstruction plates. These plates are are generally a little are somewhere kind of between these dynamic compression and semi-tubular plates. One thing I, I I wanted to mention or forgot to mention on a dynamic compression plates is these plates are typically thicker, right? So these plates may be like 3.5 millimeters in thickness per se. And so they're not as easy to bend as the semi-tubular plates, which are like, again, a third of a tube. These may be three, five plates. These may be four or five plates. With these, you may need an actual plate bender in order to bend the plate versus semi-tubular. You, you can bend them in your hands and your fingers. And so they have these plates that are kind of called recon plates, which are, are a little bit more malleable than dynamic compression plates, but aren't as flimsy, I guess you could say, as semi-tubular plates. And these are used in areas where you may need to counter the plate in order to fit the patient's anatomy and bone. So you can, you can have like 3.5 reconstruction plates. Uh, but again, these plates are going to be a little bit more malleable to uh, counter to the bone. Again, so this is like commonly used in like pelvis fractures, things of that sort, somewhere where you need to uh, be able to move and kind of uh, shift the plate a little bit and, and bend it in certain areas to allow it to master their anatomy. Next, you have a plate that's kind of called a locking compression plate. So a locking compression plate, basically what this is, is in the plate itself, if you look at the holes of the plate, there's a hole that has these threads, and on the other side of the hole is smooth. So on the side with the threads, you can put a locking screw, which is, a, we'll go over this in the screw lecture, but basically is the screw where on the head of the screw, there are threads that will actually lock and engage into the plate itself versus a non-locking screw where there's no threads in the head. And so you get uh, just compression from the screw against the plate. So locking compression, you have one part of the plate and you can put a locking screw in and the other part you can put a cortical screw in. So that's kind of these locking compression plates. And then you have these anatomical plates 
or these angular lock plates. And basically what this is, these are plates that are just designed for the anatomic part of the body, right? So these will, you'll see companies will have specific plates for the distal tibia that are contoured to match the anatomy of most distal tibias or for like distal radius fractures, there'll be anatomic plates that are meant to fit that area of the bone of the distal radius or same thing of the hip. There are going to be plates that are meant that are shaped and, and angled to fit the area of the hip. So these are just anatomic plates. A lot of companies have a whole bunch of different types of plates. There, there are specific plates for, for example, distal humerus fractures. So there's like a plate that is contoured for the medial side of the distal humerus and there's a place that's contoured for the lateral side of the distal humerus. So these are just your anatomic plates. And another thing to know, you don't necessarily need to know all of this, but these are just like, once you start to go around and you'll be in a lot more fracture cases and trauma cases, there are different sets that come in the operating room, right? So there are what's called a small fragment set versus a large fragment set. And if you think about it, the large fragment set just have tools that have a bigger diameter. So you're if you're dealing with like bigger bone, you may use a larger frag set versus smaller bone. If you're dealing with like a distal fibula, these may take smaller implants versus if you're dealing with the distal femur, these may take bigger implants. So small frag sets are typically implants that are like 2.7 millimeters or 3.5 millimeter screws or plates or things like that versus like large frag sets. You may have 5.5 millimeter screws or six six o screws, things like that. So hopefully this gave you all an overview of the different types of plates there are, how a plate can function. And so you just kind of get used to used to seeing some of this stuff and just used to getting in in your vocabulary.